So in the U.S., we, we typically anymore, when we, in keeping with the social media, normally a lot of speakers have a couple pictures to show about themselves before they start. So here's me. We like to fish in Minnesota. We have a lot of snow. In the bottom right-hand corner, I'm the oldest of 12 children, and my mother would be upset if I didn't say that. Um, any woman who spent 10 years, 10 years of her life pregnant uh, deserves that. Um, in the middle, I pulled that picture out. That's what remains of the Bolands and Tumivara. Um, our line's about extinct there. We've, we've, uh, our farm is, is uh, about gone. I do a lot of work overseas. In the upper right-hand corner, I, that's a school in, in Honduras that I do a lot of work with. Uh, I speak Spanish, and, and it's a very good agricultural school. And then the upper left-hand corner is, a, is a, um, one of my godchildren. We've got a lake place in northern Minnesota up, up by the Canadian border, and we do a lot of work in, this, in the snow. So that's a bit about me. And the speaker talked a bit about that on me. So I'm going to pull some slides today from a presentation that I do. It's kind of a half-day workshop. And I'm going to focus today on, on policy. So, you know, you, you've got an American coming from the land of Trump. Um, I've got to be careful because I'm being videotaped. But, but uh, um, I'm going to talk a bit about, in a broad context, one of the big policy issues we're dealing with in the United States that affects all of our trade uh, deals right now. I'm a speaker for our U.S. State Department, and I often get pulled in to speak about uh, why you should trade with the United States when we negotiate bilateral or multilateral trade agreements. And the, one of the big things as we're talking about is now this differentiation of foods. So I'm not talking about the codex or things that are more scientific in nature, but just what are consumers looking for with foods today and why that's causing, as we think about food policy, what the implications are for trade and our relationships with other countries. So as we think about some of the things that, that, that are coming out right now, think of all the label changes we've seen. So a lot of, you know, in the United States, for example, we label things on when something is good by, the, what's the, the expiration date, if you will. The Japanese use birth dates. And when I talk to my students, they often nod their heads saying, yeah, I would like to know when the food was born. Well, expiration dates, oftentimes the food is good for longer than the expiration dates, so we have gleaning programs and, and programs designed to reduce food waste, but people get confused sometimes, why, why can't we see a birth date on food as opposed to an, an expiration date? We've made tremendous uh, people don't realize some of the tremendous things that have happened in the last couple years. I'm not a food scientist by training, but I believe we're in the middle of the biggest food reformulation that we've seen in the United States since the mid-1940s with World War II. And what do I mean by that? Over the last few years, we've, we've removed all of the trans fats from most foods. We're looking at things on low caloric contents. We're doing things with whole grains, using hard white wheats and other things. And then, as we'll see here shortly, we're engaged in a big process. The food was always good, it was healthy, but when families had 12 children like my mother, they wanted cheap food. It was important to have 28 gallons of milk a week. We grew up on a dairy farm, but, but we had our, our milk delivered, and people wanted big boxes of cereal. They wanted to have oatmeal for breakfast. Today, with declining fertility rates in, in many parts of Western Europe and the United States, we now have smaller families, Last year, 2015, I should say, was the first year in the United States when more people ate food away from home than made food at home. So more people in the United States ate out two years ago than made food at home. And that's the first time we've ever seen that in our data. And that's got implications as you think about income, at least in our country and other places like us in Western Europe and so forth, with declining birth rates. And if you see what's going on around the world, birth rates are plummeting in Central America and other things. Um, we talk a lot about a $7 billion or $8 billion person world by the year 2050. Those numbers keep getting pushed back in terms of when we're going to hit those targets. So Nigerian women right now, are, they have like 8.2 children per, per um, fertile um, uh, female. Those rates are going to go down. And that pushes those birth rates back and pushes those targets back. We're seeing this harmonization of data. So it's oftentimes in our free trade agreements, it's the phytosanitary agreements that get people uh, worried about things. So our president was in China the last couple, uh, couple days, and they're coming back touting about a new uh, beef, uh, um, exp they're gonna allow imports of US beef, which they've shut off for quite some time because of one mad cow that we had about 20 years ago. People have been debating what is a young cow. 
Is it 20 months? Is it 24 months? Is it 30 months? What is the definition for a young animal? Now, we're not doing DNA testing of beef like you do here in Ireland in some cases, but we are, people differ on what, even among scientists, what are animal ages and certain things when it comes to animal health. And one could argue some of those are actually trade barriers as opposed to, to, um, to things to think about. As we'll see here shortly, I'll talk about the geographic foods. Um, our supply chains globally are looking much different. So we're, we're moving more and more to global segregated supply chains where people are trying to keep the identity of organic foods and grains, meats, non-GMOs within that supply chain all the way up until the, the retail grocery store. And these retail grocers are getting more and more market power as captains, if you will, of these supply chains and what they're, what they're looking at. People want to know more about their food. Look at all these food labels, which didn't exist five years ago. People want to know if it's made with real honey. So what is real honey? Who can tell me what real honey is? It's not maple syrup. It's not maple syrup, that's for sure. Not the real maple syrup. We have honey from China that goes through Mexico that's now, that would enter the United States. People remove some of the liquids from it. They try to reformulate it. And it's very basic sense, right? It's just fructose, it's just a sugar. But what is real honey, for example? The upper middle there, what is butter? Why is Irish butter, Kerrygold butter, the third best selling branded butter in the United States? Why is that? Five years ago, you couldn't buy butter, Irish butter in the United States. And now virtually every single supermarket has it, along with some really good cheeses too from Ireland. But why? Why are people buying branded butter from Ireland? Okay, um, so yeah, there's some there's reputation, some some uh, issues on that. What is real butter? Okay, I grew up milking cows. All right, we made homemade butter. I churned it as a boy. I mean, I know where butter comes from. I would argue our butter is made the same way you're talking about there. There's a different reason. Why do you think Irish butter is so well from a... First of all, we, don't, we have a lot of regional brands. It's a little misleading to say that Kerrygold is, is the third best-selling butter brand. In terms of a national brand, it is. But we have many regional brands in the United States. We're a big country. All right? It's grass-fed. Why is that? Why is it grass-fed? Why does that? Why do you think that's the reason? You're on to something there. Well, we, 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 that's what we've got. We've got lots of grass. For nine months a year, yeah. yes. Okay. What does grass, grass feeding do to butter? It gives it a yellow flavor, so it's 82% butter fat. So we, have, we, we would say we have white butter, you have yellow butter. So European butter, people say, looks better. Marketing, all right, so there is, in fact, I, well, I do some work with Arbonne and, and some other uh, dairy co-ops here in Ireland, and they, oftentimes when I see a sale, I'll take a picture and say, look at what this retail grocer is presenting, this, these Irish cheeses and, and butter. But if something's been fed with grass, what is that similar to? What do people think of animals fed on grass? It's natural, but what else? Environmentally friendly, okay, you're... Traceable. In the United States, people would say, well, it must be non-GMO. You don't have GMOs in, in Europe, you say, so um, it's not a big issue for you. But in the United States, people say, well, if it's fed grass, it must be non-GMO. Well, what do your cows eat in the wintertime? You have, you, have, you have soybean meal that we export to your country and other types of, of things, right? Your labels don't say non-GMO. All right, you're not misleading people, but consumers, I would argue in their head, they've got this correlation, it's yellow butter, it's from Ireland, it's an, it's an island, it's protected, it's protected to like the island. Ireland's a lot like the country of Chile, in the sense that Chile's got a, a desert to the north, the Andes Mountains to the east, the, um, um, an ocean to the, to the west and south, 
And so New Zealand, Ireland, and, and Chile have got reputations of people's eyes worldwide because they can protect their borders. And so people, there's, an off, there's also that issue right there with that, that people think about. But I also think there's an issue, but now we've got non-GMO German butter in the market, so I'm real curious to see as that supply expands, what will happen to Irish butter um, in, in the future. I don't think anything's going to happen much, but once people start labeling butter as non-GMO, what does that do to people's thoughts? You mean this is, was not non-GMO? It still would be, but we've got diehard people that run these blogs, and they, it's just amazing some of the things you read about with people as they, as they, as they look at this. Um, in the bottom right-hand corner, that big blue diagram is Kraft macaroni and cheese. How many of you eat mac and cheese? It's pretty common, isn't it? What's happened to that label? So Kraft was taken over by a Brazilian company. They've merged with Heinz, so it's Heinz Kraft. Is mac and cheese good for you? A bunch of people shake their heads like this, but they all shook their heads like this when I said, do you eat it? That, that label, they've gone through an extensive process trying to, to what they, what, I don't like the word clean label because I don't like that terminology, but that's the terminology people use. They've cleaned up their label so that people can, when they look at that ingredient list, they've got five or six ingredients now. When food scientists and others created many words after World War II in the 1950s, they just used very industrial sounding words. But they've done away with artificial colors and, and so forth. Why did they do that? Why did they quote unquote clean up their label? Okay, they want people to understand what's, what's in their food and to try to give the impression no artificial colors and and, and, and preservatives and things, okay. Okay, so not all consumers, but there's a significant part of consumers with money who want to know what their label looks like and, and what they don't want those things in their food. If you were to, so what's, what, as you see the growth of food cooperative or grocery cooperatives, which sell things like non-GMO organic foods, so organic, first of all, started out as a produce issue. People didn't want chemicals on their, their fruits and vegetables. And then it became something more than just fruits and vegetables. And so what they've done now is they also say, we want these other foods to, to have the same characteristics as what, what we want with their organic products. And so these stores, because Kraft Macaroni and Cheese did not have a label that would allow them to be sold in things like Whole Foods, the private market, Annie's Foods and others, entered that space and created uh, macaroni and cheese products that were very similar, but could be sold in these retail grocery stores, organic foods and so forth. And Kraft said, look, that's going to take market space away from us. We better make a macaroni and cheese that can be sold in a conventional supermarket or one of these uh, food cooperatives and so forth. So one of the reasons why retail grocery stores are commanding more and more power as chain captains is because they're forcing these grocery, these manufactured foods like General Mills and Kraft, Heinz Kraft and others to think about developing products that can be sold in these different types of supply chains. Um, food, aer food aeration, you know, if we had developed, food pasteurization is a good thing and yet many consumers don't understand the concept of pasteurization. We have a technology called irradiation that's really a, a pasteurization process that would do a lot to help our ground beef and other things if people would use it, but people are afraid of that word. If we had used the word pasteurization, we probably could be using that technology today and people wouldn't be complaining. The lower left-hand corner here, I've got different types of milk. So I grew up milking cows. Well, milk comes from cows. Where else does milk come from? Nuts, right? Plants. The fastest growing category in the, in the retail grocery stores in the latter part of 2016 in the United States was plant-based milks and plant-based meats. And those fill an important, you don't have to refrigerate plant-based milk, for example, and yet now all that product is sold in refrigerated spaces. 
That's very expensive to put that product, which, doesn't need, which is shelf-stable, into a refrigerated space. And yet that's where people are accustomed to looking at it. So a retail grocer saying that's a high margin product, we're going to put that into expensive space and we're going to sell that right along milk that comes from cows or animals. Um, and so we've got all kinds of different brands today, flavors um, and so forth coming out on that. The whole issue of, of corn sweeteners, many of these so-called food uh, clean labels are in the process of removing corn sweeteners, corn sugar, however you want to think about this, and replacing it with cane sugar or some type of stevia extracts, which are very difficult to formulate sometimes and process foods. So we're seeing a big, in the upper right-hand corner there, meat. Why are people eating plant-based meats? In my area of St. Paul, Minneapolis, many retailers added three feet in their meat case last year to handle these plant-based meats. Why is that? People worry about growth hormones, right? All right, so even though they're scientifically proven that no problems with those, people just don't want those, okay? And we've got a long-standing trade agreement with dispute with Europe on this issue, okay? What else? Methane. What is it? Methane. Okay, the animals, for example, just, as you think about them, there's a lot of carbon em emissions and, and so forth that people associate with feeding animals corn. Okay, it's interesting about vegetarian, you know, the numbers of people that say that they're vegetarians actually been pretty stable as a percentage of the population. But what you find is people saying, you know, I'm only going to eat meat two days a week. So I'm Catholic, right? We didn't eat meat on Fridays during Lent. And I mean, people are making conscious decisions. I'm only going to eat meat on maybe once a month or every Monday in a month or something. It's more of a the growth is really on people making conscious decisions. I will eat meat however many days a month, as opposed to becoming a strict lifestyle of vegetarianism. What else about these plant-based meats? Do people want slaughter, I'm sorry, harvesting houses for animals in their backyard? Can you find people that want those jobs? We've got immigrants that nobody wants a meat slaughter plant in their backyard. Nobody wants to, we can't find people for those jobs. You know, you got to have hairy arms and tattoos and sharp knives and, a, and you know, I, I worked, my dissertation, I spent a lot of time in meat houses um, collecting data and I often thought anytime you got a high school child or a child in, who's in his teens looking at dropping out of school, I would take them on a tour and say, this is the kind of job you can aspire to if you don't get your education. So if that's what you want to do, this is one of your alternatives in life, and they'll go back to school, trust me. Um, so this issue is, to start looking at country of origin labeling. So a lot of our ground beef in North America comes from multiple countries. We need grass-fed beef to take our, I mean, McDonald's wants a, a hamburger patty with a certain percentage of, of ground, of, of lean. Most of our animals are fed corn, which doesn't lend itself to very lean uh, hamburger. So this plant-based meat technology, which I think is going to take off very quickly in, in, in um, especially in ground hamburger, is probably not going to take off. And nobody's talking about making plant-based foods for steak or the middle meats and roasts. It's almost always done in the hamburger side of things. This technology is what we call a disruptive technology in, in using MBA lingo, because it, it could very see rapid adoption if you've got a chain captain like a fast food restaurant that wants to, uh, to, to take this. Um, so, and then real quick, I'm gonna run through my, a couple other things here and I'll take questions. So, one of our biggest trade issues we deal with in the United States is we have no history of geography-based foods. We don't have products or denomination of origin. We're a young country, 225, 230 years old. So we have no history of, of something like Parmesan cheese, which has been made for 800 years using a similar technology, made in some type of artisan way, like they do around Parma, Italy. We're going to have to find a way to deal with this in our trade negotiations. And the Canadian-European Union trade agreement has given us some ideas on how you might do that. Um, <clears throat> you know, if you look here in Ireland, you're developing more of these. I review some of these applications, as, and you look at some of these, and you think to yourself, is there really a differentiation? Does the Irish Sea really have a different heat spectrum that's going to make salmon taste different? 
So as you start thinking about these things, are they examples of <coughs> trade barriers, or are they truly differentiated like, like Parmesan cheese? And that's one of the difficult things. We've now got six, you have 6,000 of these. The, you know, I was in Kazakhstan here a while back. They're trying to get mare's milk and, and horse meat uh, marketed under this label. Many countries are looking at doing this, similar to what we've done with wine and, 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 and uh, certain types of alcohol. So there's good reasons why you're doing this. We just don't understand the United States because we think we can make a similar product that doesn't have to have these trademarks. So there's some differences on trademark law, which I'm not going to go into, but but that's one issue we have to, to work our way around. Um, clean label, I talked a bit about this, is not just retail grocery stores, but fast food service has to deal with clean labels. So Panera, one of our what we call casual dining restaurants, went through a process of removing certain type in, uh, ingredients from their foods. And so emulsifiers, things we use to make French onion soup and other things like that, sometimes it's very difficult to find substitutes um, to do that. And so their broccoli cheddar, they went through 60 different versions of this over a 30-month period to reformulate their, their, uh, some of their, their soups. Um, so Interbrands in, in London has an annual summary of the world's best-selling brands or the most valuable brands. Right now there's no retail grocers on that list, but my suspicion is by the year 2030 we're going to have a retail grocer or two on that list. These chain captains are increasingly dictating what these supply chains look like. And there's a lot of reason why I did a lot of, I did a lot of um, national media when, when, when Amazon bought Whole Foods. And one of the comments I made was, Amazon has got an Amazon brand, if you will, but no one really recognizes that. We have a lot of store brands or retail grocery brands in, in retail grocery stores. Is Amazon's strategy to try to take Whole Foods, which has a very good brand rep recognition, and make that their Amazon brand, if you will, going forward. And they've also, you know, um, Whole Foods got some prime real estate, but one could think about Amazon taking long-term view. They want to become the store brand or the retail store brand for the entire United States. Um, and then one, one last thing here, and then I'll take questions because I want to make sure I get time for questions. This whole issue on animal welfare, we haven't really tackled this yet in some of our trade issues as well. So most of the world, um, they don't castrate animals. We do that in the United States. We start thinking about gestation crate policies. We think about animal uh, buildings and so forth, why we do things and what those labels look like. We use just, uh, gestation crates and pigs for pre pregnant um, sows. And then people said, we don't want to use those. I had a student collect all the brands of companies that had introduced a gestation crate policy. And if you look at those brands, you ask yourself why, you start thinking about sausage, which comes from, from pigs, many of these stores had a little store like you have across the way here that has breakfast. So those, those little operations also had adopted station grade policies. And if you're trading, we do a lot of trade with, with, North, with Canada and, and Mexico, anybody doing trade with those countries also had to adopt gestation grade policies. So it's amazing when you start looking at animal welfare issues and what they mean for trade, how it affects different companies and what they do for brands. Uh, GMOs, we talked a bit about this. We're, where we're coming to consensus is people just don't want them. There's nothing wrong with them. They're not, they're not unsafe. The evidence is overwhelming on that. The environmental benefits, we can't blame bee, you know, the lack of bees for, for GMO products. You can find some positive correlation, but you can't find causation. Increasingly, people are saying, we just don't want these. And that's a different issue than saying, let's make them a trade barrier. That's, that's a consumer-driven issue. And if people don't want them, now we're having another debate with the new CRISPR technology. So that the CRISPR technology is focusing on things like, look, if you fry potatoes in a pan, sometimes they turn black. That black has got carcinogen products or things that cause cancer. We can remove that. And that's what they're doing. Apples, when you cut an apple open, it's not supposed to turn brown. That's a mutation that happened um, quite some time ago. We can solve that with this CRISPR technology. So if you look at the scientists doing work with CRISPR, they're trying to focus on food attributes where consumers might nod their heads and say, yes, that makes sense to me as a consumer. It's okay for you to use that technology to 
to fix that mutation. And then maybe finally, how are chain captains such as retail grocers and restaurants going to uh, increase consumers to realize that food is complex to communicate? And they're looking more and more to retail grocers to try to explain to them something about their food. So many retail grocers now have got policy statements of what they've studied and what they're doing internally, and I've been on some of those studies, how, they, how they're going about trying to convince consumers why they allow food with certain types of technologies, such as GMOs or non-GMOs, to be sold in their stores. And I talked a bit about that. Sustainability, um, we're moving more and more to that on the carbon issue, issue thing. Let me just stop there, and, and I've got about seven minutes, it looks like, for questions. <laughs>